Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, Martin. Hello, Walt. <laughs> <laughs> Are you well? Yes. Carrying on? Yes. We have work to do. Let's jump right in. Um, interesting. We're carrying on with John. Yes. Hopefully, in this yep. episode, we can wrap it up. Yeah what we want to say, and then we can move on again to what's happening in the world. But I'm sure that everybody has been really blessed, because I know I have, in studying the Word of God. Yes, you can't go wrong when you study the Word of uh, God. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for one of these episodes that we can discuss important things, and we ask therefore that you bless our discussion, enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit, Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to deal with the Gospel of John. Let us just look at one or two quotes again to set the stage for our study on For Your Ears Only. It was at this time that Christ gave his disciples the precious instruction found in the 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th chapters of John. He knew that they must have special instruction, for unless divine power were combined with human effort, their future work would prove a failure. He was about to be separated from them. They would no longer have him as their visible counselor. To take the responsibility in all matters, they must be instructed, for were they to leave the divine agency out of their efforts, they would not accomplish the work he had appointed them to do. In all their ministry, upon which they should enter to bless humanity, they must build upon a divine Christ. That's a powerful statement. A divine Christ. A divine Christ. So, Christ, Jesus Christ, God. Yes. Today, a great work is to be done. The Holy Spirit is to work through human agencies. A partnership between God and the workers must be maintained. Man works because God works in him. All the efficiency and power is of God. Yet God has so arranged that all the responsibility rests with the human instrument. These are the appointed conditions of partnership. Men are required to move amongst men doing a divine work. God designs that they shall have power from on high. But if they fail to seek for this power, if they neglect to improve the facilities which God has provided whereby they, whereby they may reach the highest standard, they fail to uplift fallen humanity. So, Martin, This is a very important task that God has given man to do, to be a partaker in the proclamation of the gospel. Mm. But if you do it in your own strength, then you are... In trouble. It's like when we studied the loaves and the fishes. Yes. Who did the multiplication? Christ did. It's like when you, sometime you mentioned that if the disciples had to do it, they would have divided the, the bread. loaves and the fishes. But when Christ did it, he multiplied it. Yes. We work on the principle of addition. But Christ works on the principle of multiplication. Mm -hmm. So let us go to these chapters, Martin, because this is the crux of the matter. We're not going to go into a verse-by-verse -verse detail. Chapter 13 deals with the Last Supper. And as we mentioned last time, when the disciples came to the Last Supper, they were still arguing as to who was the greatest. And Jesus gave them not only uh, an object lesson, but a great spiritual truth as well in the communion service that he initiated at this very important juncture. But we are dealing, especially here today, with what happened uh, to Judas and how the story unfolds. So the disciples had come together, and as we said, they were arguing about who was the greatest. And Jesus showed them that uh, they had to be servants one to another. But he also 
told them that one of them was going to be a betrayer. And he says in verse 21 of chapter 13, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And so they looked at one another and they wanted to know who was it going to be. And then Jesus answered him and said, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. Now, sop is a morsel, if you read in the margin. In this Middle Eastern sit setting, it is customary to have dips and share and dip your bread in whatever there is, like hummus or any one of those things. And so this is what he was referring to. He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. I don't think anyone realized exactly what was going on because this was part of the, the way in which they ate. So nobody took particular notice. But then he said to him, And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. But verse 30 in particular is very interesting to me. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Mm. Martin, if you leave the presence of Christ, darkness. it's darkness, it's mm. night. So the children of light remained behind, and from verse 31, which, by the way, is a new paragraph, in my Bible again, this is bolded, the number 31. So this means in the original, this is a new paragraph. Now Judas had left. What you do, go and do it quickly. You're not going to change your mind. You have passed the point of your probation. Go. Mm. And it was night. And therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Now came the time when he was dealing with the final issues, and he had his final group of loyal disciples around him. And then follow the most precious lessons that are very important to us. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Martin, if we look at the Christian church today and we look at the strife that reigns in many, many places, then people can honestly sometimes ask, do they have love for one another? Now, this is after Judas had left. Mm -hmm. So if we apply this to the time in which we are living and we must have love for one another, then we must be one in mind. We must be one in thinking, one in attitude. Yes, and one in goal. And one in goal. Mm -hmm. And we must love one another. And then men shall know that we are his disciples. So in particular... This love will be manifested even greater once the Judas principle has left the church. Yeah. So, yes, once the shaking has done its work, then these people that are left will be one minded. How do you achieve this oneness? You must have, you must have the same mindset, you must have the same doctrine. That's you must be unified in terms of these issues. That's why when Jesus said previously in the chapters, 
that him and the Father are one. That's the same. They've got this one mindset. And that is the same mindset that these people, or us, these at the end, will have to have to go through. Now, it's interesting that the disciples that were left were the ones that were going to bring the message, the message of the early reign, under the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And yet, even at that stage, they were still going to deny him, as Peter did. Because all the disciples ran away. Mm. So in, the, in a sense, none of them could point finger, but Peter just went a step further and verbally, verbally mm. uh, denied him. Verbally denied him. And then come the instructions for their ears only. The most wonderful instructions. And these are the things that need to bind us together. These are the things that should be in our minds and in our hearts as we prepare to receive the latter rain. Mm. And of course, chapter 14 begins with that marvelous, marvelous introduction. And it basically is the gospel in essence. It's the whole Bible in just a few verses. Yeah. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. That is the entire plan of salvation in a nutshell. And if people were to study this, there would be far less confusion in the world. And it says quite clearly that he is going to go away, mm -hmm. that he is going to prepare a place, yeah. and that once this has done, been done, he shall return to take his disciples so that they may be with him for all eternity. So, you know, false doctrines in terms of what happens in the afterlife would not exist if you believed in, in these statements. They're very plain. Exactly. You're not going to heaven anytime until Jesus comes to fetch us. Jesus will come to fetch it. And I go to prepare a place and I will come again and receive you. So the receiving doesn't take place at death. It takes place when Jesus comes to resurrect the dead. And all the previous chapters that we discussed made this very clear. I am the resurrection and the life. Lazarus come forth was a demonstration of what will happen at the end of time. And this part where Jesus tells them, um, whether I go you know, and the way you know. Yes, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Yes. They know and him. If you know him, you know the way. It's interesting that at this stage, Thomas still inquires. Mm. <laughs> How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him then quite plainly, this is absolute straight talk. There's no parable, no. nothing here. Don't you understand, he says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. By this simple statement falls every false religion on the, in this world. Go on. Go on. You cannot go to heaven if you don't know the way. And if you want to understand God, you have to read verse 7. Yeah. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also, mm -hmm. and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. In what sense have they seen him? In the character of Christ. Just as Christ is, so is the Father. So this dichotomy that we have in the world and the Jesus seminar and all of these groupings that say we should love the Father, we should love the Son and, and hate the Father. It's ridiculous. Once you read the Bible and you understand the mindset of the plan of salvation. It also comes back to the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. There's, There's no such thing. No it's such the thing. same 
it's exactly the same. And the fact that the judgments were shown in type doesn't negate the fact that there will be a judgment in anti-type that will be exactly the same exactly. as that in the Old Testament. And yet Philip again says, show us the Father and it will suffice us. And Jesus said, have I been so long with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? So this dichotomy of thinking that we have in the world would disappear if people studied John chapter 14. Mm -hmm. And it is alive and well and living today in the world. Unbelievable. Catholicism goes even further and says nobody comes to the Father except by the Son, but nobody comes to the Son except by Mary. Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. Where do you read that? Nowhere. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. And then he has this amazing promise. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. Now, Martin, nobody can do greater works than God. Nobody can do a greater work than opening the eyes of someone that has been born blind. So, in what sense must we understand this verse? It will have a wider application. Correct. In extent, the yes. work will be greater because Christ preached locally, but the disciples will preach universally. Mm. And uh, imagine the power that must attend the message. In that first century, mm. after Christ, the whole world had been reached, yes. even China. And you can go back into the history of China and you can read in the writing and the symbols that they use, the entire gospel is ensconced in those symbols. Mm. And then that was overturned again, and they returned to their old ways. And uh, I'm sure God wants to awaken that memory in the last days in which we live. So nations like Japan and China and all of these where the gospel of Christ has been basically obliterated again, and largely due to the actions of the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. These people will one day have to give an account for what they have done to the gospel of Christ. From verse 13, we have the promise that you can ask anything in his name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. This is again one that has been misconstrued and misapplied. Anything in his name means anything in harmony with his character, selfless character. Anything you ask in terms of your drive to spread the gospel to others will be answered by yes, Christ. If your mindset is that of Christ and the Father, then that what you ask will be in line with what their mindset is. Correct. Now, verse 15, again, is a new paragraph, and it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, if this is Jesus' direct instruction. instruction to the disciples, going out to preach to the world, how important is the commandment? So that was something that was absolutely essential for them to receive the former rain. Yeah. How essential is it for us then to receive the latter rain? Precisely the same. So it says there, if, that means conditional, right? Yeah. You've had, you have a choice. If you love me, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. And then there's a consequence, right? Mm -hmm. A result. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. So, Martin, what is the condition for receiving the comforter? 
keeping the commandments. There's no doubt about it. No doubt. So how can you turn it around and say that the commandments have been done away with and all you need is the Holy Spirit? Yes. It's impossible. It's impossible. Absolutely impossible. So this negates an entire religious system that is prevalent in the world today. Yeah. And then he tells us and qualifies who the comforter is, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So what is the condition again for the Holy Spirit to dwell in you and be in you? Keeping the commandments. You must know Christ. Yep. You must Love. know the way, the truth, and the life, and you must keep the commandments. Love him. That's it. That's it. It's not rocket science. Mm. So can you separate the law from the gospel? <laughs> no, no. You, not at all. No. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. So our life is bound up in the life of Christ. Mm. And as he was obedient, so we have to be obedient. All that day ye shall know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. And then he reiterates it. He that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. What is the condition of, for Christ to manifest himself to his, to his disciples and his people? It's in you keeping the commandments. But it boggles the mind that the churches have moved in the direction of anomia getting rid of the law of God. Mm. Unbelievable. I don't think, if you read verses 15 to 21, these words of Jesus, this admonition that Christ gives them, and he begins and ends it, what do you need? Keep the commandments. I can't now, it's interesting it. that Judas, not Iscariot, said, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us? Mm. It's almost like God is instilling this, this want of information in his disciples so that he can answer. Answer, exactly, yeah. Huh? yeah. Like previously, Thomas was confused. Yes. He's asking the whole time. Now, Judas, not Iscariot, is asking the same. Now, doesn't this show what kind of a teacher Jesus is, right? Now, when we, when we look at this answer, he says to him, if a man love me, he will keep my words. So now he changes it slightly from mm -hmm. commandments to words. So he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. It's interesting that we is plural, right? Mm. We will come. So, you are bound to keep the commandments and you are bound to believe the word. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on this earth? That's a question That's a he question. asks. And if you look at the various denominations in the world, how many of them have, for example, embraced evolution? I think most. Most of them. There are some that haven't. Southern Baptists say mm. they still believe in creation. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, of course, believe in creation. Uh, the Catholic Church has denied the creation account they believe and have propagated and introduced the Big Bang Theory through their Jesuit uh, influences. So it is a rather sad state of affairs that those that seem to wield the power within Christianity deny the very tenets of the Bible. Mm. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which you sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, 
and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. That's a tremendous promise. So he will teach you all things. How does he teach you? It brings to remembrance. Well, you have to go back to see if you keep my words. So you'll have to internalize the word. You'll have all to right. read. So he's not going to teach you apart from the word, right? No. You have to go back, and if you read, and that, he'll bring to remembrance what you've read. And if you haven't read it? You can't remember it. Then you can't remember it. It's as simple as that. And then the rest of this chapter 14, he just reiterates that he has given them peace. So we can have peace in the midst of the storm. That's why it was necessary to browse through them so that you can see the emphasis and the necessity of Yes. Them. So will we face storms? <laughs> he yes. promised us we'll All right. face storms. And in the midst of the storm, can we have peace? Yes, because he has the voice to calm the storm. <laughs> when you think about it, there was this terrific storm and Jesus fell asleep in the boat, right? And the disciples said, Master, do you not care that we are perishing? Don't you care? Mm. How can you sleep under these circumstances? Well, don't we feel the same when everything is going wrong and we've got all this uh, we are, problems? We are very inclined to say, do you not care? But uh, the fact that he is asleep in the boat should be enough, right? Exactly. So, Martin, now that we've spoken about the Holy Spirit, let's just read another statement here. This one is about the nature of the Holy Spirit that is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. You know, even to Nicodemus, it said, it's like the wind. It listeth here and there. You don't know where it comes to, from. You don't know where it's going to. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture and put a human construction on them. But the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church. Regarding such mysteries which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden. So while we are on the subject of the Holy Spirit, if we try to pin it down and define it exactly what the Holy Spirit is, we are dealing with a subject that has not been revealed to humanity. So silence is golden. Deal with the manifestations. Dwell upon what the role of the Holy Spirit is. That's true. What, what we just read. Read your Bible, study it, and the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance that that you need to, to help others. Correct. So what is the office of the Holy Spirit? It is distinctly specified in the words of Christ. When he comes, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. That's John chapter 16. We'll get to that one. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. If the sinner responds to the quickening influence of the Spirit, he will be brought to repentance and aroused to the importance of obeying the divine requirements. Is this statement in harmony with what we've read so far? 100%. 100%. So let's go to chapter 15. The burden of chapter 15 is that Christ is the true vine. You cannot be a branch and be alive if you are not grafted into that vine. Verse 2 says, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are all clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Do you see something special in that verse? Mm -hmm. The you, word. You cannot divorce it. No. You cannot put this away and then by the Spirit walk. Now, this is fascinating because the devil, the devil is a master at separating the word mm. from your actions. Yeah. Abide in me and I in you. So how do you abide in Christ? By staying rooted in the word, That's right? It. Okay, and then you will bear much fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same shall bring forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Again, that tells us that 
we are not the bee's knees. We can do nothing in our own strength. If it is not supported by the Holy Spirit, then it is a useless exercise. Mm. In verse 7 it says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Again, Martin, mm -hmm. how often must he say it? If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, then. This is the only basis for our religion. We have no other creed except for the Bible. Mm. The spirit of prophecy is a lesser light that shows the greater light and brings to a fore the power of the message. That's it. And so it can never be in contrast to the Bible. And that's why whenever you find conflicts between the spirit of prophecy and the Bible, make sure you've got the right version of the Bible mm. because that can cause controversy. You're absolutely right. Now, again, if we continue here, it talks about the love which he has. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. And then it gives again the condition, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Now, Martin, let me just get this straight. Did God love us while we were yet sinners? Yes. Yes, because while we were yet sinners, he died for us. So the issue of him loving us is not conditional. No. But abiding in his love is conditional. In other words, when, when it came to Jerusalem, he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to take you under my wing, but you would not. Now your house has been left for you desolate. He said that with a tear in his eye, not because he wanted to reject them, but because they had rejected him mm -hmm. and he honored their decision. That's, and that will be, at the end, exactly the same. Exactly the same. So he's got a condition. Yes, and then he says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. But there's a condition to that. That's it. Here it comes again. Verse 13 says, Greater love is no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And ye are my friends, if you do what I command you. Martin, can it be plainer? Cannot. not. And How does Christianity get away with it by denying the very basis of the centrality of the Gospel of John? And why did, like he says here, no greater love than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends? Did he lay his life down for them? Absolutely. And you know what he says? He says, I do not call you servants, but I call you friends. This is the amazing thing about the character of God, that he didn't create you to be a slave. He created you to be a permanent friend and companion to him. One in mind, one in purpose, one in attitude. As the Father and Jesus are one, so we have to be one, but we have to be one in him too. Yes. It, it is an amazing God that we are dealing with here that calls us friends. There's no other deity in this world that is like this deity. That's why this one is the only one that is worth worshipping. He makes it quite plain. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. In other words, the whole world is arrayed against God. But through this darkness, Christ reaches out and he says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to you. But if you are in Christ, if you are in Christ, verse 18 tells us that the world will hate you. Sad, eh? If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, 
therefore the world hates you. Now, can we just stop here? If we go back, here it's hate. What if the world hated me? But just before that, it says what you must do to love him. Yes. Keep the commandments. Yes. So if you go now to what do they do in hating him? They don't keep his commandments. Very good point. Yes, they don't keep his commandments. And if you do keep his commandments, the world will hate you too. If you keep the commandments, they will hate you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. His sayings are his word. Yeah. Right? That's what they are. So if you keep the word of God, the world will hate you. If you keep the commandments, the world will hate you. The devil was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. They that keep, keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. And that's in Revelation. That that, that's in the book of Revelation. It's amazing. Uh, God shows us exactly what we need to be going through to the end, but he also says, look, you're going to have trouble. Now, I've heard so many times the opponents say, you people are all works orientated because it's just about the commandments, the commandments, the commandments. Well, Martin, how often have we read now about the commandments? The wouldn't, they say, wouldn't they say exactly the same to Jesus today? Exactly. They would. They, <laughs> they can't be any different because the world hated him then because of it. They crucified him. No, they... And they said, we have no king but Caesar. And again, they will say, give us Caesar. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're clamoring for Caesar right All now. Right. Mm -hmm. Please come and mediate between Ukraine and Russia because God is not going to help us. They said that plainly. The Orthodox prelate said, prayer will not help. Please, Pope, come and help us. Unbelievable. And the worst of it is that 21 tells mm. us, but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. They will think that they're doing God's service in the name of Jesus Christ if they persecute those that keep his commandments. And why? Because they think they know me. And how did he say you, know, you can know him? If you keep his commandments. The commandments. And, and you, if you read the word. If you understand the word and internalize it. You have to eat it on a daily basis. Oh, but it's, a, it's such a powerful statement that he says, they will think that they do it for his name's sake. It shows you how deceived you can be. That you can do something that you think you're doing for Christ. But because you've got a lack of reading the word and wanting to do what God requires from you, it's out of your mind. You think you're doing God a service. So, if you take children at school, why do they conform with the activities of all the others? We call that peer pressure, right? Mm. Now, are adults immune from peer pressure? No, no. not at all. Do the churches... Exert peer pressure? Ecumenism. Because of peer pressure about what we think other people are going to think of us. No, we have to... We have to align ourselves. Now, Martin, do you think it's important that uh, the world should know about the Ten Commandments and obedience to Christ and mm, believe thus says the Lord? Your life depends on it. Eternal life. Okay, why was it necessary in Revelation chapter 14 to preach the everlasting gospel again? Because they forgot it. Because they'd separated the law from the gospel, right? It had to be preached again. Verse 24, if I had not done amongst them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father, but this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. So he's quoting Psalms 35 verse 19. They hated me without a cause. They had no reason to hate him. No. 
and in which which law was it written? Their law. Their law. Yes, the Bible. They had it at their disposal, but they rejected the tenets thereof. Mm -hmm. But then comes a but. I always like the word but in the Bible. When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of Truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And you shall bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So there are a number of witnesses. The one witness is the Holy Spirit that will testify of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now Martin, I don't want to throw too many spanners in the works here, but just a question. If I testify of you, mm. am I someone else than you are? Yes. Let's leave it at that, right? Thank you. And ye also shall bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. So the Holy Spirit will witness, in other words, convict the mm. heart, and the disciples will witness. And if you come into harmony with what we have just read, then you will be a disciple of Christ. And if I can bring it also back, you don't have an excuse. Because just like them, all was written in your law. And we've got it in our hands. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And then we move to chapter 16. And again he reiterates in verse 2, they shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Martin, do you think that's important that we should understand this for the time that we are living in? Yes, because we're heading for this at a very quick pace. Are we, are we repeating this history? Mm -hmm. So what applied here applies to us. And if you study these, these chapters prayerfully, and you internalize them, wouldn't that strengthen you for the time and for the conflict that is ahead? Exactly, because like we've mentioned earlier, Jesus is in the boat. So when the storm comes, instead of asking him, don't you care, you must know he's there because he cares. Correct. Now from verse 7 onward, we read more about the Holy Spirit. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So, Martin, who is he sending? He's sending someone to represent him, right? That's it. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Mm -hmm. Now those are three hammer blows. Now, if you look at the world today, when they pray for the Holy Spirit, what are they praying for? Power. Power. They're praying for power. But this Holy Spirit that is referred to here will reprove the world of sin. Mm. Big hammer blow. Yeah. I'm a sinner. And what is the contrast of sin? Righteousness, yes. Righteousness. And what is the standard of judgment? The law. Okay, have we had a lot of things to say about the law? No. All right. What is sin by definition? Transgression of the law. Transgression mm. of the law. So Martin, is this which the Holy Spirit will do to convict the world of sin, righteousness and judgment, is that in harmony with what the Holy Spirit is doing in many professed circles today? No. No. It's giving you power, and uh, it's a power religion. It's like a drug. Yeah. And it also is many times linked to pro prosperity. All right. Now, Martin, you come out of, that, out of those circles, right? It's not so long ago that you, you were enjoying that environment. Was it very pleasant for you to find out that the true function of the Holy Spirit was to convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment? In the beginning, it's not, not at all. But as you grow, you're very appreciative 
that this is the way to, uh, God helps you. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin, you'll just carry on. You'll just carry on and you wouldn't even be aware of it. Now, he's got a, a very interesting twist here in verse 9. Of sin, because they believe not on me. So here's another definition of sin. The sin is not believing in Jesus Christ. It's That's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, you can only be guilty of this sin as he qualified before. He said, if it weren't for my works, they would be without sin, right? Mm -hmm. But now that they have seen it and they reject it, therefore their sin remains. So if you, if you are convicted by the Holy Spirit and you reject it, mm. then it becomes for you sin. Yeah. And it also means that you did not believe Christ. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. So he goes to his Father. So now you have to accept righteousness by faith. Faith, that's it. This is what, what verse 10 is. Yeah. Verse 10 is righteousness by faith. That is the third angel's message in verity. And the third angel's message is linked to the commandments, in particular the Sabbath commandments. Exactly, the fourth one. Now, have we seen that throughout this issue? When we read Isaiah chapter 58, wasn't yeah. that the issue that had to be restored? Exactly. So how much depth is there in these, these chapters of judgment because the prince of this world is judged? Satan. In other words, whatever the theology of Satan is, is judged by what we have read here, which is the opposite. That's it. Satan's philosophy is plainly stated, do what thou wilt is the whole of the law. That's it. And those two concepts are in conflict. Mm -hmm. Salvation by works, salvation by faith. So in these verses we have righteousness by faith, we have the judgment, we have all of these things. Now I'm sure that Jesus would have liked to explain it in some more depth because he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Because they weren't ready to receive it. Their mind was still waiting for this Messiah that would release them from the Roman bondage. Verse 13, how be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. So, you know, just make a list, a mental list of what he does. He will convict you of sin. Mm -hmm. He will show you what, the opposite of sin is, which is righteousness, righteousness, which means you must move from sin to righteousness. Once you have moved from sin to righteousness, then you do not come into the judgment. Mm. Then you are saved by grace through faith. That's it. Hmm? But then he has a couple of other functions. He will lead you into the truth because he's called the spirit of truth and he will guide you into all truth. Now, didn't he say, my word is truth? Yes. All right. So in other words, you cannot study the Bible without the Holy Spirit. No. Nope. When I was an atheist, I read the Bible. I read it like a, a mythological storybook. Mm. And I came up with all kinds of fanciful ideas. I actually wanted to write a book which I wanted to title The Genes of Genesis, which was a book on evolution. And I'm so glad I never wrote it because it would have been the most foolish thing that you could ever imagine because the fool says in his heart there is no God, right? Mm. So he will guide you into all truth. I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit got hold of me before I wrote this rubbish and then read Genesis as it stands. And it also brings to mind how important it is that you believe every word because every word is truth. Yes, and how many can you leave out then? Nothing. So when you read this and you read it as it stands, believe it because it's truth. And how many people bring out all sorts of their own concoctions all out of the this? time? So he will guide you into all truth. 
He will not speak of himself, but whatever you shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. So there will be prophecy. So is Jesus here predicting that the Holy Spirit will raise up prophets for the church? Definitely, yes. Does he predict the same in Revelation? Yes. So the gift of prophecy will be retained until when, Martin? Until the end. Till the end. And he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Now, any religion that glorifies the Holy Spirit apart from Christ is not fulfilling verse 14. No. Because the Holy Spirit has the function of glorifying Christ. Mm. So when Pope John Paul II said, Come Holy Spirit, you are the one that we want to glorify publicly. Is that fulfilling the commission that we read about here now? No. No, this is, a, this is a very serious issue. So how important is it that we study these things? This is eternal life studying. And it's absolutely essential because every deception that is in the world mm. today is being addressed in these chapters. Every That's deception. It. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. A little while and you shall not see me. And again a little while and you shall see me because I go to the Father. So this is just the prediction that he will be going to the Father. And they will be dependent upon the word and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And for the rest of chapter 16, he is reiterating, like a good teacher, what he has said before. That we have to stay rooted in Christ, that he is going to the Father, that we are to rely upon the Word and the leading of the Spirit. And then he says in verse 32, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that you shall be scattered every man to his own. And shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So he predicts that they will be scattered. Martin, can we expect a terrible persecution and a scattering? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But be of good cheer. He has overcome the world. So these are things that we can expect. That brings us to the final chapter before the crucifixion of Christ. And that is chapter 17. So modern chapter 17 is basically a prayer. Mm. Jesus is praying that that which he has explained to them in chapters 14, 15, and 16 will be rooted in their minds and in their hearts, right? Mm. So it, it, is, it is a glorious prayer of dedication. So when we think of the times we are living in, do you think the time has come where Christ is giving a glorious prayer of dedication for those that have a message to present to the world? Well, he's our intercessor, isn't he? Yes. And soon probation will close. And he says here in verse 2, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might, kn might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And then he, he talks about how he has glorified God on earth through his perfect life, his perfect obedience, his perfect humility. And now, O Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So that shows, again, the eternity of Christ. In verse 9 he says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, 
but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. This world, Martin, is coming to an end. Mm -hmm. We can pray for the world. We can pray for the conversion of the world. But this world is coming to an end. There is no solution for this world. Just like the Jews rejected Christ, so the world is going to reject Christ. So we can only pray that people will come out of the world. Now Jesus says in verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. This is such a powerful prayer. This unity in the context of the chapters that we are reading, occurred after the Judas principle had left. Yeah. And we must expect this prayer to be of special significance for the times when the latter rain will be poured out. Because he says quite plainly, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. So if we abide in Christ, if we are rooted in his word, if we keep his commandments, none of us will be lost. If we appropriate righteousness by faith, through faith, then none will be lost but the son of perdition. The Judas principle will have to leave. He says in verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So he puts another stamp on it that we must be rooted in the word yeah. of God. And I just want to read verse 18 as well. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I also sent them into the world. We are back at what our duty is. Yes, this is our duty. Just as the man was sent to the pool of Siloam, mm, which means he was sent, so he that was born blind and now could see was sent. When he was sent, they kicked him out. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> right? We can expect exactly the same. We were blind. God gave us spiritual eyesight. We are sent. We're not going to be received very well. No. But, but we're still sent. We're still sent. But thank God, not all will reject the message. Yeah. Just as they didn't all reject the message then. He says in verse 20, which is the, the final paragraph of this chapter, it says, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which, will, which shall believe on me through their word. So that Holy Spirit will go with God's people throughout all the ages. And here in the end, mm -hmm. for their ears only, he tells them this wonderful story that people will believe through their word. But their word will be one with G God's word, with Jesus' word, because that's... It has to be in harmony. That's what the whole time they said. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, and that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So, Martin, if there are all kinds of movements, like ecumenical movements, etc., and uh, world interreligious uh, unifications and fraternities that reject the very tenets of what we have read here, mm. then that is not an argument that we should be one with error. It's amazing because they want to be one to, to establish peace. Yes. But how can there be peace if you, the oneness that you are trying to get is not based on the word of God? Absolutely. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. Now, when it comes to the glory, 
The glory is always the character of Christ. Mm. And uh, we have to emulate that character. It's very hard. We have a fallen nature. So we have to cling to Christ and realize that without his indwelling spirit, we have no hope of salvation. Man, and let go of the things that you want to keep on to that's in conflict with us. Yes, and we must also remember that presumption mm. is God's mm. counterfeit to faith. Mm. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. This is a beautiful prayer. The only way that we can be perfect is if he is in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory, says the Bible. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundations of the world. This is the very essence of the plan of salvation. Christ uniting humanity back with divinity, planting his cross between a separated God and humanity and uniting with his divine arm grabbing the throne of God with his human arm embracing humanity, opening the way, being the ladder that unites us with divinity and he wants us to be with him in heaven to see him in all his glory not even Moses no. could see that without being hidden in the cleft of the rock and then only from the back imagine seeing this glory face to face mm. if you are a sinner Martin and you cling to sin then you will be consumed by this glory because the Bible says that people will be destroyed by the brightness mm -hmm. of his coming. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Martin, that is the culmination of the final, final instruction to the disciples. It is the message for our time, yep. and then follows the story of the crucifixion. So may God bless these words to us. May we study them prayerfully. And be safeguarded from many a pitfall in the world if we internalize these words. Yeah. And may we do what these words say and go to the world with it. Let's be sent. Amen. Heavenly Father, you have given us an instruction. We need to be rooted in you. We need to be rooted in the word. We need to understand the plan of salvation. We need to understand the relationship between law and grace. We need to understand the workings of the Holy Spirit. And we need to go to the world and warn them. Bring them back to obedience. Repair the breach in the wall. And point them back to the author of creation and the author of recreation that mud lord that mud in the beginning and that mud that was placed on the eyes pointing to the creator god and his authority and his willingness and his longing for a relationship which is embodied in the fourth commandment help us to bring this message to the world in jesus name Amen. Amen.